Number 10, Shame of Thrones. Weird, but in a great way. Because for this story, we are heading over to the alternate reality belonging to the Little Marvels. Over in the Infinity comic Giant Size Little Marvels issue number four, we get a glimpse into Dr. Von Doom's lair and his evil game night, which apparently happens every other Tuesday, according to Magneto. However, the whole issue consists of a tangent where the invited villains complain that Doom is the only one who gets to sit in a throne while they game, whereas they're all relegated, you know, to normal seats. Doom argues it is because he's the most accomplished ruler among them all and that he answers to no one. However, his mom has something to say about that. Vicky? <laughs> Number 9. What if Sergeant Fury had fought World War II in outer space? I was literally going to just say that to introduce the story, but then of course it's already been said because that's the name of the story. In this comic, we get to see what it would be like if in addition to the general opposition during World War II, there were also aliens involved who wanted to, of course, invade Earth. As such, the Howling Commandos take to the stars to fight against German World War II soldiers in addition to alien invaders known as the Baytans. Did I also mention that Nick Fury is still smoking throughout this entire issue, even while he's wearing a space helmet? Well, some things would change in this scenario, it seems others would remain the same. How do you even smoke in a space helmet? <laughs> That seems like it would be terrible. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more multiversal Marvel lists, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number eight, the final showdown. Mutant X really had a whole series, but for the purpose of this list, we're just gonna focus on one of its story arcs that takes place in the alternate reality of Earth 1298, as it was a 32 issue series, so I mean, a lot happened. The basic idea here though is that instead of X Factor, we have a non government or corporate mutant team known as the Six. Havoc in this reality ends up with Madeline Pryor, and the two of them have a child together named Scott. Yeah, it's. It's a little, it's a little different than 616. Here Maddie does become the Goblin Queen, but like how we have the Phoenix Force, she becomes infected with the Goblin Force and its influence, turning her dark. Initially, Maddie is actually known by her hero mantle, Marvel Woman. As such, Havoc and their son Scotty must fight against the Goblin Queen. After a long buildup where no one is able to stop Madeline, it's revealed that Scotty is able to due to his insane level of power. He rids his mom of the goblin influence, but also banishes her in the process. Don't worry though, just like in main continuity, Maddie would return here as well. I believe she gets banished to like the center of the earth. It's a weird place, but it's a, it's a pretty good place, I would say. Mutant X, would you, should you read it? Nah, I think you, you should read it. I think you could read it. I don't know if you should, but you definitely could. Number seven, what if the X-Men had lost Inferno? I love this comic, mainly for the panel at the end where Alicia Masters Storm whispers to her newborn babe, I love you, baby. I think it might be one of my all-time favorite panels ever, actually. But there is lots of weird stuff to love from this issue, including the fact that Doctor Strange and Rachel Summers also randomly deliver this baby at the end. In this what if, we imagine what would have gone down if the Goblin Queen hadn't been defeated and instead was victorious. One of the things that would have come about? Her unleashing the beast within Wolverine and turning him into a villain who devours babies. Also, Rachel becomes trapped and later freed from being a bridal mannequin? I, I think that's a thing that happens here. That's definitely looks like what's happening. Also, I love Rachel as a bridal mannequin. And how after she's like, thanks, my face hurt, too much smiling. Oh, by the way, Doctor Strange who frees Rachel, he also gets to wear a cool eye patch in this world. Why? Because he's Doctor Strange. He gets an eye patch. I like it. Everyone should have eye patches. I want an alternate reality where everyone has an eye patch. Number six, Ghost Racers. This is a series that comes from the Battle World pocket dimension that was governed by God Emperor Doom. Just like we had the Thor Core, here we have the Ghost Racers, which is basically like its own category of racing, creating an organization or like even a company out of that set form, like NASCAR. The Ghost Racers are made up of various ghost riders who, of course, race one another for Battle World's entertainment. And and of course, so wealthy fans can ideally make some funds on the wins and losses of each race. Although all the riders are pitted against one another and eventually Arcade, who is in charge of them, sends them to take down Robbie Reyes, the current racing champion, eventually they all remember what things were like before Battleworld and they decide to rise up against those that are controlling them. Which I love. Also, I just love the idea of like, <laughs> 
like just a group of racers that are just all ghost riders and they're like, we race each other for, for fun. <laughs> this is what we do now. Ghost Racers. Number five, what if Wolverine battled Conan the Barbarian? In issue number 16 of the second volume of What If, we get to see what would happen if Wolverine somehow came to the time and lands of Conan and the duo ended up fighting one another. That's basically what what ifs are for, right? Just seeing people that would not normally fight fight and who will win. In order to revive his love, Conan is asked to bring another soul in her place to sacrifice. The soul that he decides to bring is actually Red Sonia. So that's not great because Wolverine, having fought with Red Sonia previously, had basically kind of fallen for her and he does not agree with what is going on because of his own sentiment. He wants to rescue Sonia, probably because she reminds him of Jean Grey. Honestly, it's pretty weird to me that no one has ever said that like Jean Grey and Mary Jane Watson look similar considering people have both thought that they looked like Red Sonja in the comics. So do all women with red hair just look the same? Is that the implication here? Or do all three of these women actually closely resemble one another but we never really acknowledge that like Jean and MJ like look very similar, like weirdly similar. And Red Sonja's in there too. It's like the tri, the trifecta of like redheads. In the end, Wolverine takes Conan's hand in a fight that the two have, and the two end up permanently swapping places with Conan returning to Wolverine's home reality and Wolverine staying in Conan's age. Wolverine finds a happy ending with Sonja. Conan, not so much. He like sees Jean and then she goes full Dark Phoenix and then that's the end of that. Number four, Age of Ultron versus Marvel Zombies. Another even more bizarre story coming at us from God Emperor Doom's Battle World. This comic was all about the world that existed outside, actually, of Doom's Battle World, known as the Deadlands. And if you didn't like living by Doom's rules, well, you certainly wouldn't like this. But this might be where you would end up. Defy Doom, and this could be a place that he put you. Age of Ultron versus Marvel Zombies explored these Deadlands that were watched over by Annihilus' insect creatures. Creatures. And yeah, it's about as wild as it sounds. Around every corner, with the flip of every page, awaits more gore. Folks losing their heads and monsters, monsters, monsters! I think in a world of zombies versus robots, no one really wins. Is that the takeaway here? Also, because this is Battle World, there are lots of appearances of random multiversal characters, such as young Hank Pym, who's kind of like the main character of this, from the past alternate Earth of 51920, and the Pilgrim Punisher of Earth 15513. At least he looks like a Pilgrim Punisher. I like that he still has his skull shirt though. So he's like got the hat, he's got the coat, and he's like still got this like very 80s style looking logo and shirt. <laughs> Number three, Ruins. Ruins is just the most messed up kind of weird that a multiversal story can be. This comic offers a much darker take on what the world could be like with superpowers. Of course, it is a story by Garth Ennis, so yes, Darker is definitely where we're going here. As brutal as Runes is, well, I, I kind of love how dark and awful it gets. The series deals with the less fantastical, more literal interpretations of powers and their uses and how less hopeful civilians and government agencies might react or take advantage of said superpowers. In this world, Quicksilver is just a torso with his limbs moving too fast, causing him problems. So they all had to be amputated. At least that's what's implied. Or they just didn't like that he went fast, so they amputated them. The Hulk is an irradiated pile of tumors, which ultimately dies under the weight of his own mutation. And the Silver Surfer ends up driven mad by his own cosmic existence, taking his own life by clawing his own chest open while floating through space. This is a bleak and disturbing world filled with pain and suffering. Not heroes in capes. That's part of what makes it great, and part of what makes it weird, and part of what makes it horrifying. <laughs> Number two, what if Conan the Barbarian were stranded in the 20th century? And if you thought Wolverine and Conan fighting was weird, it just gets a whole lot weirder with this issue. I, however, I guess I should say that it gets a whole lot less weird as the previous Conan What If we talked about was actually from the second volume of the series as opposed to this issue that we're talking about which is actually from the original series. In issue 43 of What If we learn what would happen if Conan, instead of just coming to the modern day, was stranded there and stuck there. This What If was actually inspired by another fan favorite What If featured in issue 13. What if Conan the Barbarian walked the earth today? In this story, because Conan never gets teleported by lightning home, he becomes a criminal. Because, I mean, why not, I guess? He's confused, he doesn't know what he's doing. However, after creating a gang and getting into some trouble, he attracts the attention of the Avengers. But Captain America sees more than just a brute and believes Conan is just 
misguided, but he has a hero's heart, truly. He offers him a spot on the Avengers, and we actually never learn what Conan decides, because the issue ends. Talk about a cliffhanger. I don't know if we'll ever come back. Do we ever come back to that? It's like, will I call him? Won't I call him? And then the Watcher's like, well, I would tell you, but I can't because that's a story for another time. Maybe if we ever do it. Number one, Marvel. Even saying the title sounds just like an experience. <laughs> I don't even know where to start with Marvel because this continuity feels so just like non-existent here. There's no through line. The story is meant to be about Cal AOL, a play on Cal L, a kid from the future who is sent back in time to save the world and to save himself. In the future, you see the world is about to end. Fortunately though, that doesn't happen. While Al doesn't have any powers, he somehow is moderately successful as a hero. After the world doesn't end, his parents send the time machine they originally sent him through back in time to pick him up. But Al decided to travel back in time to the beginning instead. There he meets maybe God and also learns that Wolverine evolved from an otter and dinosaurs can talk. With every issue in this story, you ask yourself, how can it get any weirder? And then it somehow does that. Also, what's up with these covers? They're almost completely unrelated to the plot of the comics. I guess sexy ladies sell comics, and so who needs a plot was the thought process with Marvel. At least with the covers. And maybe with the inside of it as well. Because I don't really know what the plot is about. <laughs> Number 10, Harry Osborn. This one's a dead friend. One of Peter's closest friends is Harry Osborn in the comics. Well, he is at least until he turns into a villain himself. Harry ends up dying at the end of Spider-Man 3, sacrificing himself to save Peter and inevitably redeeming himself. Peter forgives Harry for all that he has done and he and Mary Jane kind of reluctantly get back together and attend Harry's funeral, mourning their former good friend and at one point, kind of villain. I mean, definitely villain. Harry in the Raimiverse is played by James Franco, but Dane DeHaan plays the character in the Amazing Spider-Man series. Dane DeHaan's Harry Osborn becomes Green Goblin in the second film and is a secondary antagonist in a film that, like Spider-Man 3, suffered from too many antagonists. I'm just saying. I don't think we'll be seeing James Franco reprise the role in the MCU for reasons, but there is still a chance that Dane DeHaan could reprise the role. I would be interested in seeing more or Harry Osborn in some capacity in these movies, as long as we don't bring back Spider-Man's costume from The Amazing Spider-Man. I forgot how much I disliked that costume. I went back to those movies for this list and I was like, man, still don't like that costume. <laughs> it's not for me. Number nine, Uncle Ben. Cliff Robertson, who originally played Uncle Ben, sadly passed away back in 2011, but we could still bring this character back. Martin Sheen is still alive and well, who played the character in the Amazing Spider-Man series, or there is a chance we could meet a new version of Uncle Ben from the past, before he died, in the current Spider-Man film series. After all, I mean, we never got to meet Tom Holland's Uncle Ben, if he ever had an Uncle Ben, although he's still Peter Parker, so while it goes unmentioned pretty much, we can assume he does, I think. And friends, before we move on to our next spot, if you are loving this list and you want another list where I talk about more alternate characters in the Spider-Man universe, or just alternate Aunt Mays, because that would also be cool, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8, Flash Thompson. Well, we have an excellent Flash Thompson currently in the MCU with Tony Revolori, who does a great job of balancing his hatred for Peter Parker with his love of Spider-Man. There have been a few portrayals of the character that have come before him, so it's possible we could get a whole team of Flashes in the MCU if they all decided to show up from the multiverse. It all started with Joe Manganiello, who played Flash Thompson, school bully and original boyfriend of Mary Jane Watson in the Raimiverse. Also, fun fact, this was Manganiello's breakout role. I completely forgot about this until revisiting the films, and wow, I just think that's such a weirdly perfect casting for Flash Thompson. Following up Joe was Chris Zilka, who played the bully turned sensitive wannabe friend to Peter Parker in the Amazing Spider Man series. I also really like Chris's portrayal of the Flash, so I'd also be cool with him showing up as well. Give me all of the Flashes. Number 7, Genki Lee. 
Another character that shows up in Into the Spider Verse is Genki Lee, and this is definitely a character I would love to see also show up in the MCU, along with Miles, of course. I don't think you can have Genki without Miles. In Into the Spider Verse, Genki was not portrayed as being quite as close as he is to Miles in the comics, and that is part of the reason that I want to see these two pals together in the MCU. I want to see that awesome BFF connection. In the comics, Genki is Miles' best friend, who knows about his secret identity as Spider Man. He hails from the alternate Earth of 1610, the ultimate universe, just like Miles. Hopefully, where Miles goes, Genki will too, and hopefully, that place that they're both headed is the MCU. Number 6, Gwen Stacy. Gwen Stacy is well known in the comics for being Peter's first ever love, and for many fans, his one true love. Personally, I'm a big shipper of Peter and MJ together, but you know, Peter and Gwen are still iconic and have a lot in common, and I respect that. In the Amazing Spider-Man series, Gwen Stacy was played by Emma Stone, who I absolutely love. Unfortunately, just like in the comics, Peter was unable to save Gwen at the end of The Amazing Spider-Man 2, and she died. Peter thought he had saved her, but learned that ultimately he was too late. He gave up being Spider-Man, but eventually returned to the mantle after listening to Gwen's valedictorian speech, which inspired him to become a hero once more. Emma Stone did an awesome job playing Gwen, and it would be really, really awesome to see her return and to see Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man get to actually say goodbye to some version of her from the past or alternate future. Alternatively, I also wouldn't mind seeing Bryce Dallas Howard return to the role of Gwen, as she also played the character in the 2007 film Spider-Man 3. And I also just love Bryce Dallas Howard. She has done so much since then and has proven herself an amazing performer and an amazing director. Number 5, Spider-Gwen. AKA Ghost Spider. Of course, this character doesn't come to us from any of the cinematic realities. Well, I mean, she is in Into the Spider Verse, which is a film, so it is cinematic, but it is animated, so. Yeah. Either way, we can still get a live action MCU version of Spider Gwen, or Ghost Spider as she's known currently in the comics. How cool would that be? Perhaps even someone who has played her before would be up for suiting up and rising to the challenge to take on Gwen as a superhero. Or perhaps we could even see a new performer take on the role and show up as a new character in the MCU, but a familiar character for those fans of Into the Spider-Verse or of the comics. Number 4, MJ. Alternate MJ in this sense. For this one, I am talking about the return of the great Kirsten Dunst as Mary Jane Watson, Peter's next door neighbor, high school crush, and true love. I love Zendaya as MJ, but that doesn't mean we can't have some alternates show up as well when the multiverse starts to open up. And I think that is where we're headed here. If that happens, then we could all of the sudden be seeing different MJ's appearing. Who knows, maybe we'll even see Shailene Woodley's performance, as she apparently had her portrayal of the character cut from The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Number 3, Dr. Octopus. Doc Ock appears in 2004 in the second Spider-Man film to come out of the Raimiverse, Spider-Man 2. There he was played by Alfred Molina. Although we haven't gotten the film yet, Molina appears to be reprising the role of Doc Ock and will appear in the MCU in Spider-Man No Way Home. He's spotted in the trailer, and aside from that, he has been rumored to be making a return almost since day one with this movie. Molina did himself confirm his return in an interview with Variety, and Zendaya, who plays MJ in the MCU has also confirmed his return in an interview. We'll have to wait to see him show up in the MCU and see on what level he's returning. Will he still be a villain? And how did he escape the river he supposedly drowns in at the end of Spider-Man 2? Number 2, Venom. With the post credit scene from Venom Let There Be Carnage, this is a character that many of us expect to see in Spider-Man No Way Home, or at least somewhere in the MCU. Although to be fair, Spider-Man really makes the most sense here when we're talking about when and where this character would be expected to show up. Tom Hardy's Venom is a bit of a hot mess, which is also why I cannot wait to see what will happen if we get both him and Tom Holland's Spider-Man together on the same screen. Venom of course does seem to break through to a world where Spider-Man's identity has just been revealed by the Daily Bugle. We even see Tom Holland's face on the TV screen when we see that reveal, so it seems very likely that these two will be meeting up up again somewhere in the MCU. Hopefully Venom doesn't lick Spider-Man when they do meet up, because I'm not ready for those weird fanships. Number 1, Norman Osborn. Obviously, Willem Dafoe's version of Green Goblin is still something all of us remember with extreme fondness. No matter how you feel about the Raimiverse, you probably still love Willem Dafoe and his portrayal of Norman Osborn. Will Norman be coming to the MCU? 
It seems super likely just based on all the teases that we've gotten. Will he be played by Willem Dafoe? It's what many of us are expecting as the multiverse gets cracked wide open, likely as a result of Doctor Strange's spell backfiring, possibly because he was so distracted by Peter's constant rechanging of the parameters of that spell he was attempting to cast, which would of course warp reality. Green Goblin is one of the most iconic Spider-Man villains out there, if not the most iconic. I would say the most iconic, but some people might disagree. So it'd be really awesome to see him return in the current film franchise. Number 10. What if Spider-Man had never become a crime fighter? What else would Spidey get up to? Well, in the long run, he basically ends up as a kind of television personality, an actor, and a producer. Spider-Man makes movies that he stars in as an action hero, but still keeps his identity a secret. In the end, he works toward promoting other vigilantes through films that he produces, and still ends up getting involved in crime fighting of sorts. A ton of villains in the form of the Sinister Six end up fighting against him. Well, really they end up fighting against Daredevil, and then Spider Man's like, Daredevil, hold me. But in the end, he's like, I gotta help because Daredevil's just one guy and he doesn't really have superpowers in the same way that Spider Man does. Included in this Sinister Six team up is J. Jonah Jameson, who blames Spider Man for the destruction of his life and his paper. In the end, Spider Man realizes that he really mucked up by using his powers for gain instead of for good, which, fair. But he did have a really sweet cape, so there is that. Number 9. What if Spider Man joined the Fantastic Four? The story that started it all off. What if Spider Man joined the Fantastic Four is what if that, in theory, doesn't really sound too crazy until you realize what happens as a result. Spider Man initially attempted to impress the FF by breaking into the Baxter building to show off his skills and strength. This happened way back when in the original comics. However, in the main continuity reality, they weren't too impressed by his antics and initially denied him entry to the team. In this version of the story, however, Sue Storm feels compelled to give Spidey a chance and help make it work so that he can pay his and Aunt May's bills while also acting as a hero within the team. However, she later becomes jealous when she is left behind on a mission and Spider-Man gets to go, which, I mean, fair enough. Sue's like, um, hello, I'm here too. In the end, this causes her to run into the arms of Namor, who she then joins, leaving Reed Richards, and with Spider-Man taking her place on the team. Sue is also transformed into an Atlantean by a device Namor created just for this purpose, in case I guess it one day day happened that Sue wanted to join him and become an Atlantean, and she can no longer as a result breathe oxygen. I just love how this story ends, I feel like it's kind of random, but it's also kind of great. I just ship Sue and Namor so much, that's the problem here. I'm into it. I'm like, yes, Sue, be Namor's conscience. Rule the underwater kingdom. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more lists like it and more what if videos, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Also, we got a what if playlist, so go click the playlist wherever it is on the screen. I don't know, is it here? Is it somewhere? Click it. Number 8. What if Thanos joined the Avengers? Just even saying this title feels weird. This one comes to us from the one shot What If Infinity Thanos. In this story, Thanos ends up joining and being accepted into the Avengers while they face off with the Builders. He and the team succeeded in defeating their enemy, but at great cost, losing Captain America along the way. <sighs> in a shocking twist of events, even more shocking than Thanos becoming an Avenger, in my opinion, he also ends up taking up Cap's shield after he dies in battle, and almost seems to mourn his loss? It's a weird one, but if you want to see Thanos rub shoulders with Thor and Captain Marvel, then this is definitely the story for you. Number 7. What if you were Spider-Man? This is one of those very short stories that is summed up within basically a page, or in this case, two pages, two panels. Here, the what if question posed is what if you, yourself, were Spider-Man? I mean, if I were Spider-Man, I would probably carry my partner a little more securely while swinging around town, and I'd try to be a little kinder to myself when it came to all the self guilt and blame that we usually see Spider Man feeling over all of his failings. I'd definitely be doing weekly therapy sessions if I were Spider Man. But don't think too hard about what you do differently or the same as Peter Parker because the end to this what if is pretty hilarious and dark all at once. Because you are then greeted with a panel featuring a tombstone that says, Here lies Spider Man, where there is also a little space for you to fill in your name and a bunch of villains surrounding it. Because of course, none of us average Joes could make Make it as Spidey. Har har. But also, it's probably true. I don't think I could actually make it as Spidey. Although we would have powers, right? I guess if we didn't have powers, we'd really be screwed though. <laughs> 
Number 6. What if Helen Taylor had become Nova? This story takes place in the pages of issue 15 from Marvel's first What If volume beginning in 1977. Here we get a few stories involving alternate characters taking up the mantle of Nova. One such character is a woman named Helen Taylor, who is basically a random civilian, redhead, and a wife. Or should I say a widow? She gets the power of Nova just after her husband is murdered in the streets in front of her after a mugging gone wrong. Helen swears to use her newfound power to get revenge, believing the powers are kind of an answer to her plea for some way to extract vengeance on the murderer, who we know as Willie DeBrow. Or Willie DeBro, depending on how you want to say that. Nova sets off shaking down every criminal joint she can find in the city and making quick work of the kingpin along her way to boot. The Fantastic Four manage to stop her and capture her to find out exactly what her powers are and where they came from and sort of why she's doing all this. And while this is going on, we learn that months ago, Willie perished in a car accident and has been dead ever since. What a twist. And if you're like months ago, does that make sense? Yes, this story takes place over the course of months. I actually went back to look for that because I was like, that's so crazy. It's such a long period of time. A long period of time and only a few pages. Number five, what if Ben Parker's nephew was Galactus? I love this story. This is a humorous what if story included in issue three of volume two of the what if series. In this story, we find out what would have happened if Uncle Ben's nephew was Galactus instead of Peter. Galactus arrives home to find out that his Uncle Ben has been murdered, but he refuses to accept this, mourning the death of his uncle, who gave him his very first microscope. Oh no! With a mere thought, he vaporizes his uncle's murderer, reducing him to protoplasmic slime. Then he uses the power cosmic to restore his uncle to full health, even giving him powers and turning him into a silver surfer version of himself. Silver Uncle Ben? The story has a happy ending with Aunt May satiating her nephew's hunger with a very hefty helping of wheat cakes. Oh, it's so great and so wholesome. Number 4. What if Wolverine had lived during the age of Conan the Barbarian? Or more specifically, what if Wolverine had fallen through a portal and ended up in the age of Conan the Barbarian and then lived on there? Yeah. This is what happens here, and of course, because this is what this story was always meant to be about, Wolverine and Conan end up going head to head, because we all know this is really a what if Wolverine and Conan fought each other story. In the end, Wolverine falls for Red Sonia because redheads, and Conan also ends up falling for Jean because redheads, after he falls back through a portal that sends him to Wolverine's time by accident. All in all, Conan ends up getting pretty messed up here, losing his hand, and then when he does return to Wolverine's time without Logan's presence, Jean ends up going full dark phoenix and basically destroys the universe. Meanwhile, it's a happy ending for Wolverine who stays in Conan's age and ends up with Red Sonja. What a strange but fantastic adventure. You can check this one out in issue 16 of the second What If volume starting in 1989. Number 3. What if Spider-Man married Black Widow? This one is another one panel story brought to us in Volume 1's jam-packed humor issue, issue 34. Here we see a one panel story that answers the question, what if Black Widow and Spider-Man ended up getting married? This is also just a strange question to pose, as these two, well they don't have a ton of interaction in the comics, and they've never really been known to have any kind of long lasting romance that could potentially lead to wedding bells. However, there could be a reason for that it turns out. The what if uses a bit of wordplay for this scenario, implying that because Natasha is a Black Widow, she would end up eating Spider-Man. After all, that is what Black Widows try to do, in nature that is. I don't think Black Widow, I don't know if Black Widow could actually catch Spider-Man in the comics. I feel like he might be a little too fast and he's also got a spidey sense, but whatever. It's just a fun what if story, so taking it way too seriously. <laughs> Number two, what if the original Marvel bullpen had become the Fantastic Four? In this what if we get to imagine what it would be like if the original Marvel bullpen had become the FF in real life, each being given their own superpowers matching the actual Fantastic Four team. Stan Lee as such becomes Mr. Fantastic, Flo Steinberg becomes Invisible Woman, or Invisible Girl, as she was still known then. Sol Brodsky becomes the Human Torch, and Jack Kirby becomes the ever loving thing. The story is crazy over the top, and it doesn't seem to paint any of them in too kind of a light, to be honest, with the staff being transformed by a mysterious device delivered to the office, sent courtesy of the S people. But who are the S people? They end up becoming even more famous than their comic book counterparts, the original Fantastic Four, and eventually ask Prince Namor for help. They don't get turned back into their normal self but they do uncover the mystery of who the S people are. Any guesses? S it turns out stands for Skrull. Surprise. I mean, I was kind of surprised by that because I was like, what starts with an S? And for some reason, Skrull did not come to my mind. Not reading a lot of Skrull stuff lately, obviously. Number one, what if you were the Red Skull? 
I get the idea of what if you were Spider-Man, but what if you were the Red Skull? I mean, out of all the villains to pick, that is certainly a weird one to include here, Marvel. I did not see that coming. This story is also featured in issue 34 of the 1989 volume of What If, right under Spider-Man. Now I see what they were trying to do, give you the option of a what if you were a hero or what if you were a villain, because you know, that seems kind of fair. But I mean, given Red Skull's history, it just seems like a, a weird one to include when you could have picked I don't know, a bunch of any other villains that exist that people might want to be more. Like what about Doctor Doom or Green Goblin, which would make sense with Spidey, or even sometimes villain, sometimes hero, all time thief, Black Cat. I mean, I would want to be Black Cat, wouldn't you want to be Black Cat? She's so cool. Number 10, what if Jane Foster had found the Hammer of Thor? This one isn't so strange for the premise, but it's more bizarre because of where the premise took us in the end. This is a story we've also seen adapted to the main continuity, though fortunately, it does not quite share this same ending, which I'm pretty happy about, to be honest. Jane ends up finding the Hammer of Thor and becoming the Goddess of Storms, taking up the mantle Thordis. Lady Sif, missing Thor, ends up finding and falling in love with Donald Blake, who is later revealed, of course, to be the true Thor when Odin asks Thordis to return his hammer to him. As thanks for her service, however, Odin makes Jane a goddess. However, as Jane was in love with Donald, who is now Thor and is in love with Lady Sif, her heart is broken and she has to be returned to her mortal self because of this. But Odin has a better solution and proposes to Jane, who agrees, to marry him and then they all live happily ever after. Ah. With Jane finding that those very qualities she both admired and loved in the mortal Don Blake are also to be found in the father of immortal Thor. My goodness. That's a very strange ending to that story. How about instead of being with my son, you be with me, his father, ha ha. Okay, Odin, what? I feel like I like it better when Odin just doesn't really like Jane. I think that works more. Is that weird? Number nine, what if the Avengers were the last superheroes on Earth? This story allows us to imagine what the world would be like if all the superpowered beings on Earth were defeated by the Avengers. At the behest of the Scarlet Centurion, the Avengers attempt to eradicate all superpowered beings, including themselves. In the end, after all threats have been defeated, they decide to disband, being the last ones with powers, in order to usher in an era of peace on Earth. They all go off to live their own normal ish lives. Thor returns to Asgard. Tony returns to being a billionaire playboy in Las Vegas, only to realize that it doesn't really bring him any joy and actually considers entering into politics. And Janet Van Dyne and Hank Pym actually seem to find quite a bit of happiness going off and getting married and focusing on their time with one another, which it's kind of sweet. I guess if they weren't superheroes, it would work out pretty well for them. Scarlet Centurion does return to threaten Earth and forces the Avengers to come together one more time, but after defeating him, they once again go their separate ways back into retirement. And they also kind of question like, if being a superhero is actually a bad thing, because does it create more problems than it solves? Just a quick reminder, if you love these what if lists, I personally love bringing them to you because these stories are amazing. Be sure to show us that love by giving this video a thumbs up, sharing, commenting, subscribing, all the things. Number eight, what if the Gamma Bomb spawned a thousand hulks? This story comes to us from volume two of the what if series that started back in 1989. In issue 71, we get to imagine a reality where instead of just one Hulk, or you know, the members of the Hulk family plus Hulk, we had 1,000 of them, which I would say is ultimately too many Hulks. In this story, it was the bombing on Hiroshima that resulted in these thousands of Hulks coming into existence, survivors of the attack that were basically mutated, so they became Hulks. In the end, Bruce Banner, aka Hulk, who of course goes on to become the Hulk in the story, must attempt to stand up against this army and attempt to defeat it with the help of some friends. Number seven, what if Betty Brandt instead of Spider-Man had been bitten by the radioactive spider? This one comes to us from a three part story and is simply one story within that. It is from the original What If series volume one from 1997, issue number seven. Here Betty Brandt instead of Peter Parker is the one bitten by the radioactive spider, gaining spider-like abilities. While the the story isn't a strange premise at all, like I don't think it's weird for Betty Brant to become, you know, a version of Spider-Man. What really makes this one stand out for me in terms of its weirdness is Betty's costume here, which is... 
It's something. It's also odd that in this alternate reality, Betty happens to be the only alternate person to become Spider-Man that manages to survive the ordeal, with both John Jameson and Flash Thompson in this issue, who are featured in the other two stories, dying as a result of gaining spider powers and attempting to use them. Instead of Betty choosing not to pursue the thief that kills Peter's Uncle Ben, she simply is unable to because she used up all her web fluid posing for pictures for Peter. Which is a whole other thing, but also, wait, can't you just go after them anyways? Don't you have superpowers? It doesn't matter that your web fluid is gone. Anyways, she still blames herself for Uncle Ben's death and decides to quit being Spider Lady, which I think is a little harsh. I feel like she wasn't really super responsible for that, but I guess she could have gone after him. I don't know why she didn't do that. Be like, use your super strength, climb on walls, do any of the other things you can do. Number six, what if Submariner never regained his memories? This story allows us to glimpse into an alternate reality where Namor never met the Human Torch and never ended up regaining his memories and returning to Atlantis, learning that he was the true ruler of the underwater kingdom. Instead, the Submariner remains unaware of his true heritage and ends up joining a ship's crew, finding himself inexplicably drawn to the sea. Hmm, I wonder why. The captain of of the ship Namor's friend McCandless ends up being mutineered against and goes overboard while injured when he believes they found the lost entrance to the center of the earth. Namor, or Mr. Smith as he's known, follows after him and ends up being retrieved from the ice cold water by Inuits later on. They end up worshipping Namor as the lord of the frozen sea, along with frozen Captain America who they worship as the lord of the frozen ice. And Namor's like, I guess this is my life now and I'm pretty good with it. So I guess it all worked out in the end, and now he just gets to be the lord of the sea really far up north where it's cold. Cool, I guess? Number five, what if Iron Man was trapped in the time of King Arthur? While all of these stories are based on things that actually did happen, this is also based on something that did happen. So if you think it sounds weird because it's just so random, that is a thing that actually happened where Iron Man and Doctor Doom in main continuity traveled back to the time of Arthurian legend. However, rather than getting back home in this version while Doom manages to leave, he leaves Iron Man trapped in the past. Oh no! A weird turn of events ends up leaving Tony Stark as the ruler and king of England following the death of his friend King Arthur. Tony actually proves to be a great king and lives out his days there in the past just as an accomplished and celebrated ruler. I actually wonder what effect that would have had on the present, because I feel like everything would be very different if Tony Stark were the king of England. This all goes down in issue 33 of the 1997 What If series, so you can check that out if you want. Number 4. What if the Fantastic Four had different superpowers? One of them is just being a giant brain. It's true. Actually, overall, these powers feel very Doom Patrol meets X-Men, in my opinion. In this alternate story, when subjected to cosmic radiation, the FF get completely different powers than what each member has in main continuity. Johnny becomes a robot, Ben gets dragon-like wings, Reed is just a disembodied brain, admittedly not a very great power, and Sue ends up with the least original powers, getting Reed's old powers instead. The ability to stretch her body like taffy or silly putty. Really, I feel like Sue always gets sort of like the worst part of these stories whenever she's in a what if. Hers are always so like quick or just so kind of lame. And I'm like, dang, why does an invisible woman get some cool stuff? I think she was still an invisible girl at this time though, maybe that's why. Number three, what if Aunt May instead of her nephew Peter had been bitten by that radioactive spider? This story reimagines what would have happened if once again it was not Peter Parker who received the fateful radioactive spider bite, but instead was his elderly Aunt May. This is from a humor issue, so you know it's gonna be weird and you know it's gonna be great. And it is. Aunt May here ends up getting bit after realizing that Peter had left his lunch at home on the day he and his class were meant to visit the exhibit at the Science Institute. And if you're like, Amanda, it's not called the Science Institute. Seriously, if you go to this issue, that is what is written on the building in the science. Science Institute. Of what? We don't know. She successfully delivers the forgotten lunch to Peter, cottage cheese and mashed string beans, mm, but ends up feeling unwell on her way home and finds that she has developed superpowers. She makes her own costume, becoming Spider-Man, and ends up facing off in this story with the ridiculous villain, Leapfrog because that's just how it goes. Number two, what if the Fantastic Four all had the stretching powers of Mr. Fantastic? Oh boy, I love this issue because we get 
four stories where we get to imagine what it would be like if multiple members of the FF shared basically the same powers. And in the one where they all get stretching powers, they just they just never end up becoming the Fantastic Four because their collective power is just considered well, kind of lame. Sue, in fact, insists that they never let anyone know of their powers because she feels like, and I quote, a freak. Both Sue and Ben feel as though the stretching powers are ridiculous, monstrous, ugly, and dumb. While Reed and Johnny actually think they're pretty neat and even could be useful. Still, Sue and Ben's way of thinking wins out, so the Fantastic Four never become a superhero team. The end. Number one, what if Thanos had changed Galactus into a human being? I really love this what if story personally. It comes to us from, once again, one of the humor issues of what if, so you know it's gonna be a riot. In this story, Thanos turns Galactus into a human being in order to defeat him, and Galactus ends up on Earth with no memory of who he was or is. He does, however, happen to look a lot like Elvis Presley and even sings and plays like him too. He meets a woman named Gertrude who introduces Introduces him to the works of Presley, and Galactus is basically convinced that he must indeed be like an amnesiac version of Elvis Presley, returned from the dead. He goes on to have a successful music career, and when his memories are later restored by Adam Warlock, who also offers to return his power to him, he actually decides instead to stay on Earth and live out his life here as Elvis with Gertrude and her son Toby. Which, I mean, fair enough. That sounds like a pretty good life. <laughs> 